Coming up on This Week in IT, researchers claim that ChatGPT could be used to create malware that could morph to evade detection. So I discuss what you could do about that today. Google says that Chromium will start to phase in the use of Rust to improve security without affecting performance. And Twitter officially bans third-party developers from using its APIs. So let's start with ChatGPT. So there's been a lot of fuss in the news over the last few months about this new technology from OpenAI. Now, of course, most of it is centered around things that are hopefully good, the good uses that this new technology can be put to. So it shouldn't come as any surprise, of course, that hackers are starting to look at how they can use this technology to make what they do more efficient and effective as well. So according to a report by CyberArk, some researchers have already shown how chat GPT can be used for malicious purposes. So one of the scariest things about this is that criminals can start to use chat GPT without any coding skills at all to create malware. And if you're already an experienced malware creator, you can use it to make your existing code more efficient and even use it to maybe add features to your malware that you don't currently have. Now, this technology can be used across the full injection chain. So you can even use ChatGPT, of course, to create that email, to craft that email that's used in the initial phishing attack that gets the user to click on a link or download a file or whatever it may be. Now, of course, one of the things that you may notice about these emails Hours that probably you get as well as I do from time to time is that usually you can tell that it's a phishing email by the way that it's worded because the grammar is poor, the wording is strange and usually if you read it carefully you can think well okay it's probably not a genuine email. Now sometimes they are well crafted but rarely but you can use it to create an email, tell it to write an email about a particular subject and it can come up with something that's much more convincing than somebody who you know, native language isn't English, maybe, uh, can actually create. So, you know, the hacker can use ChatGPT's technology to help them craft the full, you know, from the very beginning, the full injection path from that moment that user clicks on a link trying to persuade them to do it, right through to actually running remote code on a system and infecting it. Now, you may be thinking, what is OpenAI doing about this? Well, they do have some filters to stop people or in principle to stop people from using ChatGPT to do certain things, you know, maybe to create a piece of text that, uh, I don't know, has some kind of hate language in it, this kind of thing. So there are some protections in place, but they don't really go far enough to stop hackers from being able to utilize the technology at this stage for their own purposes. So what are we going to do about this going forwards? Because this technology is now out of the gate. It's not going to go away. So as I probably alluded to a little bit in last week's video, we're going to have to use artificial intelligence to fight artificial intelligence. And Microsoft are already thinking about how that's going to affect the next release of Windows. So developers are going to have to look at how they can use artificial intelligence to, you know, maybe protect their APIs to make sure that they're not being used for things that they shouldn't be and better train AI to detect malicious behavior. Now, of course, you should be monitoring your environment. That includes your applications and your endpoints, so, you know, the user devices where users are actually accessing your applications. And you should be using you know, a system like Splunk or Microsoft Sentinel, which is basically a, cl a cloud native version of Splunk, if you like. Now, I'm going to pick Sentinel in particular, because I know more about it than any of those other solutions, but it's not the only solution, but I'm just going to give you this as an example. There are all sorts of intelligent threat detection features built into that technology, into that monitoring solution that can be used to essentially pick out real threats from noise. You know, if you can imagine on a system, if you look at a system log, there are thousands and thousands of events happening on the average endpoint or server every day. And the job of the security operations center is to basically try and eliminate all of the noise, pick out what is really a threat and then act on it if necessary. 
Of course, you've got a huge amount of data that you need to process, and a system like Sentinel using machine learning, artificial intelligence, can actually help you do that and make sure that the real human beings only need to act on what is really necessary to act on and not waste huge amounts of time looking at events that are actually business as usual. So you just need to get smarter about how you do that and the systems that you use to make that a more effective process and not just to rely on people power to manage all of that. And of course, as I talked about last week, I'll just touch on it briefly here with the advent of neural processing units coming to Intel and AMD devices over the next couple of years and with uh, developments in the operating system itself, it'll be easier to process some of those artificial intelligent functions on the device itself. So of course that can be used for better security monitoring to make sure that any attempts to outwit the technology we have to block various actions are not thwarted by the hackers and their own use of artificial intelligence. So it's about moving the processing power to do things that were only possible in the cloud before. You can actually be able to do that on your own PC. If you're interested in what Microsoft is looking at doing in that space, then check out last week's video. And OpenAI could look at implementing authentication and authorization on ChatGPT to make sure that anybody who's accessing that is verified. We know who that entity is. So that would hopefully discourage people from using it for malicious purposes. But what can you do right now? Well, I've already said, you know, you can use technologies, you know, the intelligent threat detection built into things like Windows Defender and Microsoft Sentinel. That's something you should definitely be looking into if you're not already doing it. But there are also lots of basic security best practices that you should be doing, uh, you know, making sure that you're not giving your end users administrative privileges on end devices using things like application control to make sure that only trusted software is running on PCs. If you're running the latest version of Windows 11, there's now a consumer technology or something that can be used for consumers and maybe small businesses that don't have an IT department to manage something like application control. There's now smart app control and that's something you should definitely look at enabling if you haven't done that already. And you know, password hygiene, making sure that you have a strong password, making sure that you have multi factor authentication on any accounts that you know are privileged or anything that's being used to access sensitive data and even potentially looking at passwordless authentication but all of those things are you know really basic things that you should be putting in place everywhere today so let's talk a little bit about Chrome or Chromium, the project that Chrome is based on. Now, I came across this news as part of uh, whatever it is that Steve Gibson does with Twit TV. And basically, Steve was saying that Google has announced that they're going to start using Rust as part of the Chromium project. Now, Rust is basically what you can call a memory safe language. So unlike C or C++, it really relies on the programmer to build in any safety mechanisms into the code that they're creating, Rust does all of that for you. Now, why Rust is so special is that unlike things like, I don't know, Python or C Sharp, uh, well, let's take C Sharp, you know, it requires a runtime, uh, which it runs on top of, and it is memory safe. The problem with that is that it affects performance. And the advantage of Rust is it brings comparable performance of things like C and C++, but with the memory safety built into it. Now, according to Gibson, Rust was actually developed by Mozilla specifically for creating browsers. I don't know why it's taken Google so long to introduce this. I guess it's just really hard to change the way people do things. But they're basically saying that we're going to start using Rust to call certain libraries and we're going to gradually enable those things within the Chromium project one by one so that we can gradually start moving to these more memory safe programs programming languages. Now, Google also says that Rust should be used in conjunction with the rule of two. So what Google is saying that you shouldn't do is you shouldn't take an untrustworthy input. So almost everything that you browse on the internet is you know, untrustworthy. Process it using a language that doesn't have memory safety built into it and process it out of a sandbox environment. So maybe you would use the actual browser process 
to process that information in, I don't know, C++, for instance. So that's three things that you're doing together that increases the risk considerably of something going wrong. So they're saying that you should limit it to two. So if you're using Rust, for instance, to process untrustworthy information using the browser process in the operating system, well, maybe that's not ideal, but it's okay. But you shouldn't be using an unsafe memory language. So as Steve Gibson rightly points out uh, in that podcast, you know, we can't keep doing the same things and expecting a different result. You know, that's the first sign of insanity. Something has to change in the way that we program browsers. And of course, you know, maybe Mozilla are already using that with Firefox at the moment, but we need to move forwards with the way that we actually program the browser itself, and not just the browser, of course, other software as well, in order to improve safety considerably and reduce the number of critical security bugs that we have in things like Chrome every month. So this is a step in the right direction, and I'm really glad to hear that's happening. And just on a side note, uh, I uh, also talking about AI and Rust. Coincidentally, I saw that Paul uh, wrote an interesting article about Rust and why it's becoming so popular on forot.com. So I'll put a link to that in the description below. So if you're interested to find out more about Rust and what makes it so special, then go and check out Paul's article. He's also got a great premium article uh, this week, kind of connected again to everything to do with artificial intelligence and how that relates to what Microsoft is going to be doing with that over the coming years. All right, you know, so there's hardly a week that goes by without some kind of drama connected to Twitter. And, you know, this week has been no exception. So what's happening? Well, on the 12th of January, so about two weeks ago, it appeared that Twitter kind of unceremoniously just cut off third party developers from using its APIs. So what does that mean? It means third party application th things like Twitterific, for instance, are now no longer able to function. They just stop working basically. There was no announcement from Twitter, nobody really seemed to know what was going on and there was you know a bit of a backlash not surprisingly. Uh, if you have a look over at uh, Farot, I think Laurent uh, wrote about this this week, uh, a developer called Craig Hockenberry went on this extraordinary rant. Uh, I just kind of skimmed the article and it was a, bit, it was a little bit maybe extreme from his point of view, some of the language that he was using there uh, about you know this whole incident. Well, of course, you know, you can imagine that he's quite upset that his app, you know, no longer works. Then on the 17th of January, uh, somebody from Twitter uh, tweeted that they were now going to start enforcing long-standing developer rules. Now, I haven't read, you know, what the rules were previously uh, and whether it was the case that they just were not enforcing them. I don't know, but that was all we really got from Twitter. Now, The Verge reported yesterday that on Thursday, the uh, developer uh, rules for Twitter were officially updated to explicitly state that third party applications are no longer supported by Twitter's APIs. So, well, there you go. So now we do seem to have some official word from Twitter on this. So, you know, that's, you know, obviously a real shame for all those developers that have invested in developing third party Twitter clients, you know, that's really bad for them. But at the end of the day, it is Twitter's API. I guess they can do with it whatever they want. So what what is behind this? Well, we all know that Twitter has been having a real struggle recently to monetize the service. So as far as I can work out, I think this was according to the Verge article, Twitter doesn't serve ads through the API. So if you're using a third party client, you don't see the ads. So of course, Twitter's not able to monetize all of those users. So that's probably what's really behind this move. So basically, the only way that you can access Twitter now is either through the official Twitter application and website, or using TweetDeck, which originally was a third party application, I think, but was was bought by Twitter at some point. That is still officially an application that's owned by Twitter, uh, so you can still use that. But let me know what you think about this. Were you using any third-party Twitter clients? I haven't used a third-party Twitter client in years and years. I think the last one I used was for Windows Phone, so that shows how long ago that was, basically, because I don't think there was any official Twitter clients, so there wasn't much choice but to use a third-party app. But let me know if that's affecting you in the comments below.
If you found this video useful, I'd really appreciate if you gave it a like. And if you'd like to see more like this from the Petri IT knowledge base, then don't forget to subscribe to the channel. But that's it from me this week. And I'm going to leave you with another video that you might find interesting on the screen right now.